Hi, I'm Eric Siegel with Eric'sTrains.com. Today we've got a real winner here. This is the new three rail O scale New York Central Empire State Express set from Lionel. So the Empire State Express was the name of a daytime run between New York City and Buffalo operated by the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad later called the New York Central System, between 1891 and 1967. So this train was around for quite a long time. Now, what you're looking at here is sort of the middle chapter in the history of the Empire State Express. When the route first began service in 1891, it consisted of wooden passenger cars pulled by an American-type 440 steam engine, one of which was the famous number 999, which is currently on display at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Now, I could go into a lot more history on the 999, but since we're not reviewing a model of the 999, I'll save that for later on down the road when I do review a model of the 999. And as a side note, MTH makes a very nice model of the 999, and I'm hoping to pick one up one of these days. Anyway, eventually the American type steam locomotives were replaced with J-Class Hudsons that were not streamlined like the one you see here, and they got lavish Pullman cars and so forth to go behind it. Now, the streamlined version of the Empire State Express that you see here went into service on December 7th, 1941, and of course they could not have picked a worse day to inaugurate the new look for the train because, of course, that news was completely overshadowed by the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor on the same day. Despite the quiet rollout, the new look for the Empire State Express was a hit. The train consisted of the streamlined J-Class Hudson, and then the lavish Pullman cars and so forth were replaced by sleek and futuristic looking cars manufactured by the Bud Company. The streamlined version of the Empire State Express ran until the late 1940s, when the J-Class Hudsons were replaced by sleek looking cab diesels like the E7s and later the E8s. With the decline in U.S. passenger service, the New York Central dropped the Empire State Express name in 1967, and after that it simply became a numbered train just like any other. When the New York Central and the Pensy merged to form the Penn Central, the route became known as the Empire Service. When Amtrak took over passenger service in the 1970s, they continued to run the same route, and to this day, you can still take the Amtrak Empire Service train from New York City to Buffalo. And in fact, Amtrak has added connections to additional cities that had previously been discontinued by the New York Central or the Penn Central, such as Niagara Falls and Schenectady. All right, so now that you've got some background on the real Empire State Express, let's talk about Lionel's rendition. This was offered in the 2015 Volume 1 Lionel catalog, and then they started shipping these toward the end of 2015. I picked this up in December of 2015. So the set consists of the Streamline Hudson that you see here, and then four of the beautiful new 21-inch passenger cars from Lionel, which I'll talk more about later. Now, the train that I'm running here has six passenger cars instead of four, and that's because Lionel offered some additional cars for sale. There's a two-pack that you can buy, which is what I bought, and then there's also a Station Sounds diner car, which I have not bought yet. So anyway, long story short, my train is going to have six cars, but when you buy the set, it will come with four cars. All right, so what we're going to do is focus on the engine first, and then after that, we'll turn our attention to the passenger cars. Let's start things off with some stats and facts about this engine. The length of the engine itself is 14 inches. The length of the tender is 10 and a quarter inches. The combined length of the engine and the tender, including the space in between them, is 25 inches. The weight of the engine is 7 pounds 3 ounces. The tender weighs 4 pounds 12 ounces. That gives us a combined weight of 11 pounds 15 ounces. This engine has 2 pounds 15 ounces of pulling power, which is pretty good, and the minimum recommended curve according to Lionel is 072. 
On the inside, this engine is driven by one large flywheel motor. There are two fan-driven smoke units on the inside of the locomotive, one for the smokestack and one for the smoking whistle. And then on the inside of the tender, you'll find the electronics for Legacy Command and Legacy Rail Sounds. As usual, there are a few ways you can operate this engine. The preferred method is to use Lionel's Legacy Command System, as that will give you access to all of the engine's advanced features. However, you can also run the engine with Lionel's Classic TMCC Command System, or you can run this engine conventionally with just a transformer and some track. This model has lots of great details and features, so now let's go in for a closer look. Alright, so here's a look at the front pilot area on the engine, and as you can see, it looks pretty slick. We've got this really great looking Empire State Express logo in the middle, and then we've got some sparse detailing all around, which is par for the course, because this is a streamlined engine. You're not going to have a lot of fancy add-on parts. We do have this plate here in the middle, and that can be removed to reveal a dummy scale coupler. And then, as always, if you want to double head the engine, you can swap the dummy scale coupler out for a dummy O-gauge coupler that's also packaged with the engine when you buy it. Now, in a few minutes, I'm going to flip the engine upside down so that we can get a look at the underside. And when I do that, we'll come back to this and I'll show you how to remove that plate and how to bring the coupler out. As we swing around the side, you can see one of the two metal handrails that go down either side of the boiler. And then you can also see these nice steps on the side. And then we've got these great looking cylinders. Now this engine is a 464 type steam engine. That means it has four wheels on the lead truck, six drive wheels, and then four wheels on the trailing truck, 464. So here you can see the lead truck with the four wheels, looks nice. And then we've got the great drive wheels with that wonderful silver finish and all that drive gear looks fantastic when the engine is in motion. And then behind that you can see the trailing truck with the nicely detailed side frames. Moving up on the locomotive, here is the torpedo-like front to the engine. There's an operating headlight here in the middle, but that's pretty much all there is to speak of because it's very minimalist, but it's very cool that way. As we start to move down the boiler, you can see we've got some nice cast-in detailing and then some add-on details in the form of handrails and so forth. But this is a streamlined engine, so again, you're not going to have that much add-on detailing. We do have a nice legible builder's plate right here, and then there's one on the other side too. As we continue to move down the side of the boiler, again, there's not a whole lot of add-on detailing. We've just got the handrail and then the throttle linkage. And then down here, we've got this nice fluting that goes back toward the cab. Here we have the cab area. You can see the fluting that started up in front has become more intense. And this is probably as good a time as any to tell you that this engine is all die cast metal. So you're not going to find a lot of plastic here except maybe on the windows. And speaking of windows, we've got a little plastic window up here in front. And then we've got the side windows on the cab and they do open and close like that. There's a separately applied metal grab iron up here. On the inside of the cab, there are two hand-painted crew figures. The back head is nicely detailed. There's a red glow in the firebox when the engine is in operation. The interior of the cab is illuminated, and that light does turn off when the engine starts moving. Up on top of the engine, once again, there's not a whole lot of fancy detailing to show you because of the streamlining. We do have a smokestack here, and as I said earlier, there is a fan-driven smoke unit down in there. And as always, to load smoke fluid into the smoke unit, you simply pour the smoke fluid directly down the stack. Now, when you pour smoke fluid down the stack, it will actually put smoke fluid into both smoke units. The smoke unit for the smokestack and the smoke unit for the smoking whistle, which you'll see in just a second. Moving back, here we have some nice hand-painted pop-off valves and a red valve there. And then we've got the whistle. And again, this engine does feature the whistle steam smoke effect. So there's a hole in the whistle here. And when you blow the whistle, it will shoot smoke out of that hole, giving the illusion of steam shooting out of the whistle. On the roof of the cab, we've got three vents and all three vents do open up. Although this last one here is a bit stubborn, so it's going to need a little help. But there it goes. 
Here's a look at the back of the engine. Starting on the bottom, we've got the drawbar that has the wireless infrared tether that allows the electronics in the engine to communicate with the electronics in the tender. And you can see we've got some nice detailing on either side of the drawbar. And then up here around the cab, we've got a couple of separately applied grab irons, a couple of windows. And then if I put a light inside the cab, you can see that the back head is very nicely detailed, as I mentioned before. Looks great. Here's a look at the underside of the engine. We've got three pickup rollers here in the middle. There are traction tires on the last set of drivers. And then under the cab, there are four control switches. On this side, we've got a switch to turn the whistle smoke on and off. We've also got an on-off switch for the main smoke. And then over here, we've got the run program switch as well as the Odyssey speed control switch. Now, while we've got the engine upside down, I'm going to demonstrate how to swing this dummy scale coupler out in front of the engine. I don't typically demonstrate this in these product reviews, but I'm gonna do it here because doing it on this engine is a little more difficult than on your average steam engine. So in order to swing this coupler out in front, we have to remove this plate that's on the front of the engine. And to do that, we have to remove two screws, one up here and one down here. So let's go ahead and do that. And this is a time when it's very handy to have a magnetized screwdriver. So there's one. Let's see if we can get the other one. There we go. All right, and with the screws now removed, we can remove that plate that's on the front of the engine and set it aside. And now we can swing the scale coupler out. And there it is. And as you can see, it looks great. Now, the dummy scale coupler looks great, but what if we want to double head this engine? Well, in that case, we're going to have to remove the scale coupler and install in its place a dummy O-gauge coupler. This is the dummy O-gauge coupler that's packaged with the engine when you buy it. I mentioned this earlier. So what we're gonna do is remove the scale coupler by removing two screws, one here and one here. So let's go ahead and do that. And again, this is when having a magnetic screwdriver comes in handy. There we go. And there we go. Now we'll come in with our dummy O-gauge coupler and you'll notice that I already dropped the screws into the holes. That'll make our job a little bit easier in here. We'll bring it in. And there we go. And now, as you can see, this thing is ready to be double headed. Now, if we end up wanting to close this hole back up, we can't do it with the dummy O-gauge coupler, so we'll have to remove it and reinstall the scale coupler. And now with the scale coupler reinstalled, we can fold it back up underneath like that. And then we'll bring our plate in. And we'll grab one of our screws. Drop it in. And come in with our other screw. And there we go. And now we're back to where we started. All right, so that takes care of the engine. Now let's take a look at the tender. We've got the continuation of that great fluting. Looks awesome. It's all die cast metal construction, just like the engine. On the bottom, we've got some nicely detailed truck side frames, although they are a little bit difficult to see. There's a legible builder's plate here in the middle. We've got that nice crisp New York Central logo here. And then we've got a couple of separately applied grab irons as well. 
Here on the front side, we've got some nice steps on each side. We've got the drawbar here in the middle, and there's the other infrared sensor that allows the electronics in the engine to communicate with the electronics in the tender. And then we've got some nice casting details up here, and a couple of separately applied grab irons here, as well as on the corners. Here we have the back side. In the middle, we've got an electrocoupler that can be thrown from the Legacy or TMCC remote. We've got some legible signage back here, and then we've got this little cavernous area with a separately applied ladder and a backup light on the inside. And you can probably see some light shining through, and that's coming from above, and you'll see what's up there in just a second. And here's that view from above, so the crew can climb up that ladder and then get on top of the tender this way. There's a hatch right here, and if we open it up, it reveals a knob that's the master volume control for the engine. And then right here we've got the coal load, and this is a load of real coal. And just to clarify for those of you who are new to the hobby, when I say real coal, I mean it's real coal. There is a small amount of real coal up here just to make it look nice and realistic. Here's a look at the underside of the tender. We've got some nice add-on detailing right here. Got a little water scoop. Then we've got two pickup rollers, one per truck. There's the infrared sensor for the Lionel LCS sensor track if you have one. And then we've got two speakers down here for the sound system. One here and one under this truck. All right, so that takes care of the engine. And as nice as the engine is, and it is a beautiful, beautiful engine, in my opinion, it is not the star of the show. That honor goes to these new 21-inch passenger cars that Lionel is putting out. In a word, these cars are outstanding. The highest compliment I can really pay to these cars is that they remind me of the California Zephyr passenger cars that are being produced by Atlas. I've said it many, many times before, but in my opinion, Atlas produces the most beautifully detailed models in the business. And so for me to compare a Lionel passenger car to something produced by Atlas, that is a big deal. These things are outstanding. Now, as I said before, there are four cars in the set. So what we're going to do is start off by looking at the characteristics that each car shares, like the trucks and the diaphragms and so forth. And then we'll take a look at each individual car in the set. So here we have the truck side frames, and as you can see, they look fantastic. Lots of nice detailing. They are made of die cast metal, of course, and they are sprung. As you can see there, they look great. The diaphragms on these cars are something special. They're really some of the best looking diaphragms I've seen on a Lionel passenger car. We've got soft rubber on the outside and on the inside as well. And then there's a door in the middle that opens up like that. Looks fantastic. One of the reasons these diaphragms look so great is because when the cars are coupled together like you see here, the diaphragms are very close to each other and that makes the whole thing look much more realistic than on most three-rail O-scale passenger cars that you typically see. Now, there are two reasons why these cars can couple so close to each other and still function on O-scale curves. One is because the couplers are not connected to the trucks. The other is because of something Lionel is doing a lot these days, and that is the self-adjusting couplers. I'll explain more about that when we turn one of these cars upside down in just a minute. Here's a look at the side of one of these cars. We've got the nice fluting like we had on the engine. The body of the cars is ABS plastic, and it looks great. We've got these name plates down here. There's a New York Central name plate up here. Even the windows look great with the nice black trim around them. It all looks fantastic. I've powered up the track and I've dimmed the lights in the room to better show you what these cars look like with the interior lights on. These cars feature LED lighting, and as you can see, it looks great. Now, the LED lighting has two big advantages over the incandescent lighting, for those of you who don't know. First of all, it consumes way less amperage, so you can run a whole string of these cars and not have to worry at all about overloading your transformer. Secondly, these LED lights include capacitors, so if the car goes over a dead spot, a switch, or some dirty track, you're not going to get any of that god-awful flickering that you get with incandescent lights. So you see, if I tilt this car back so that the pickup rollers are no longer in contact with the center rail, 
you can see the lights are still on, and that's thanks to the capacitors. Now, after about 20 or 30 seconds, they will die out, but for normal operations, they should be just fine. So if you take this thing over a couple switches or over some dirty track, you'll have nice flicker-free operation, which is what we all want. While we're taking a look at the inside of the car, you'll notice that there are no passengers. And in fact, there are no passengers included with any of these new 21-inch passenger cars. Now, I'm sure some people have complained about the lack of passengers, but in my opinion, it's actually a good thing. And let me explain why. It's neither cheap or easy to get these cars made over in China, and adding passengers to the cars only increases the cost of production because you have to buy or make the figures, then you have to pay a bunch of Chinese ladies to paint the figures, and then you have to pay them to stick the figures in the cars. And so from a business point of view, there's only two ways you can compensate for that increase in production cost. You can either raise the price of the car, which is never popular, or you can decrease the quality of the car by using inferior parts and so forth. So what Lionel has done here is they've said, you know what, let's forget about the passengers and focus on making a high quality product. And that's exactly what they've done here. From top to bottom, these things are an A+. You've got the high quality ABS plastic bodies. The windows are great. You've got the LED lighting with the capacitors. The trucks are high quality. The diaphragms are high quality. Everything about these cars is right. And so for all that, I'm willing to trade the passengers in the cars because the fact is it's very easy to add passengers to a car after you've bought them. It's not easy to add quality to a product after you've bought it. So they focused on the right thing here. They did away with the passengers and focused on making a high quality product and that's what they've done and with proper care these cars should last a lifetime. Now, of course, it would be great if we could have our cake and eat it too and have a high quality car with people on the inside. But, you know, this is reality. It's not a fantasy. Lionel is a business. They're trying to make a profit. I want them to make a profit so they can stay in business. And so if they need to lose the passengers in order to make a high quality product that will hopefully make them more money, I'm all for it. The best thing about these cars is that not only are they high quality, but you can tell that a lot of thought went into their design. And the perfect example of that is that even though these cars do not have passengers in them, Lionel made it very, very easy to open these cars up so that you can add passengers on your own if you want to. All you have to do is remove four screws. It's very easy. I've never seen a passenger car that's easier to open than these cars. Now, I have another set of these passenger cars that are in the Southern road name. And I've already added passengers to every single one of those cars. It was so easy. It was a lot of fun. It's a great project for a weekend or a rainy day. Now, Lionel has already done a video on their own showing how easy it is to open up these cars to do customizations. But at some point, I will probably also do a video showing how to open these cars up and add passengers. Anyway, moving on, here's a look at one of the many doors you're going to see on these cars. Now, the doors don't open, but they're very nicely done anyway. We've got separately applied metal grab irons on either side, and some nice molded in details as well. Here's a look at the roof of one of these cars. Now, the roof details do vary depending on the car and the road name but this will give you a general idea. We've got that nice smooth ribbing like we have on the sides and some add-on details as well. Here's a look at the underside of one of these cars. Now there's some cool stuff to show you down here so let's go in for a closer look. Here we have the underside of one of the trucks. There's a pickup roller right here and there's one on the other truck as well. Now as I said earlier, unlike most three rail O scale passenger cars out there, the couplers are not connected to the trucks, and therefore they look much more prototypical. The coupler is its own freestanding assembly, so let's take a look at that. Here's the coupler mechanism, and of course this is Lionel's self-adjusting coupler. There's a spring that goes back here, and then the coupler rides in this groove, this little V-shaped groove, and that allows it to adjust automatically when the car goes around a curve so that the coupler moves out a little bit and the cars pull a little bit further apart so that they can make it around a tight O-gauge curve. 
Now, for the uninitiated, you may be wondering why all this is necessary. After all, if you're into another scale such as HO, you don't need any of this. All you do is put a coupler on the end of the car and you're good to go. It all has to do with the history and traditions of O-gauge trains. O-gauge trains typically run on tighter curves than other more prototypical scales like HO and N. And the main reason for that is because of space constraints. O-gauge takes up a lot more room and so to compensate for that we run our trains on tighter curves than you would with HO or N or some other scales. Now the problem with these tight curves is that when you're running large scale equipment like we have here, the cars can bind up or derail when they go around those tight curves. And so over the years there have been lots of tricks devised to allow the trains to get around those tight curves without having problems. One of the most common things is to actually have the space between the cars be greater. And so that's why when you see a lot of O-gauge trains, they have these big spaces between the cars and between the engine and the tender and so forth. Another trick they would use is to attach the coupler to the truck so that the coupler and the truck move together, thereby allowing the car to get around those tight curves and yet still remain coupled to the car in front and yet not bind up or derail. So what we've got here is the next evolution in that process of tricks to get these things to run on tighter curves. We've kind of got a best of both worlds approach. The coupler is no longer on the truck, so that looks much more prototypical. The coupler is semi-fixed to the body of the car, which is more prototypical, and yet it still has the ability to adjust automatically to increase the space between the cars around curves so that they don't bind up or derail. So, like I said, when you're on a straightaway, the coupler is pulled into center like it is now, and the two cars are very close together and much more prototypical looking. But then when you round that tighter O-gauge curve, it goes out like that, the cars separate a little bit, and that allows them to get around that curve without any trouble. Now, of course, all of this may make you wonder, what's the point, especially if you're into another more prototypical scale like HO or N or something like that, you may be saying, why bother? Why use this big unrealistic coupler and that ugly third rail? What's the point? Well, that's a topic for another day, and one of these days I will do a video discussing that exact topic. But for now, the short answer is history and tradition. And really, in a nutshell, the reason we do this is because this is what we like. Anyway, before we move on, there's one more thing I want to show you on this coupler assembly. And it's yet another example of just how well thought out these cars really are. As you can see, these cars are equipped with the classic thumbtack uncoupling device. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, let me explain. There is a piece of metal coming off the coupler here that is shaped like a thumbtack. And in fact, they're called thumbtack couplers because way back in the day, they actually used a piece of metal that was shaped like a thumbtack. Anyway, if you want to uncouple these cars automatically, what you do is you roll the car over an uncoupling section of track that is equipped with an electromagnet. And when you activate the electromagnet, it pulls down on this thumbtack piece and throws the coupler like that. And these have been around for many, many years. Thumbtack couplers are great, but one of the shortcomings is that if you throw the coupler by hand, there's a chance that the thumbtack piece will come in contact with the center rail on your track and create an electrical short. But Lionel has devised a workaround for this. They've actually put a little plastic cover over the metal thumbtack piece. Let me see if I can get it off here real quick. There we go. There it is. It's just a thin piece of plastic that slides right over the metal thumbtack piece. The metal thumbtack piece is still there. It's all metal. And that slides over it. And it's thin enough so that the electromagnet on the uncoupling section will still be able to pull it down and throw the coupler for you. But if you throw the coupler by hand, there is now no chance that that thumbtack will come in contact with that center rail. Very, very clever. So moving on, here is the middle section of the car. And as you can see, there's lots of underframe detailing going on here. And then right over here, there's a switch that allows you to turn the LED lighting in the car on or off as you desire. 
All right, so we've been looking at the Ruben E. Fenton coach for long enough now. So now that we've got all the basics of these cars out of the way, let's take a look at the other three cars that are included in the set. So up first, we've got a combine car. This one's called the Grover Cleveland after the former president. And as you can see, it looks great. The baggage doors open up. The other doors on the side of the car do not. And of course, the end doors open up just like you saw before. One of the most unique things about the combine car is that on the roof, it's got two rails running down either side. I'm not sure because I am not an expert on this train, but my guess would be that those are radio antennas. Up next, we've got another coach. This one does not have a name. It just has a number, 2569, but it's pretty much identical to the Ruben E. Fenton coach that you've already seen, except that this car has passengers on the inside, and that's because I added them. And as I said earlier, it was a whole lot of fun, and at some point in the near future, I will try to do a video showing how to add passengers to these cars. It's easy, and it's fun, and it only takes about maybe 30 minutes or so to fill a car with passengers. Very, very easy. The last car that's included with the set is the observation car, the Theodore Roosevelt. And as you can see, it's absolutely gorgeous. We've got the antennas on the roof, just like on the combine car. And then we've got that gorgeous back end with the red marker lights and the lighted drum head. And then on the very end, we've got a dummy scale coupler. It looks awesome. All right, the last thing we're going to do before we start this thing up is BFIMO, best feature in my opinion. So I've hinted at this a couple times already, but I'll go ahead and say it. The engine that comes with this set is wonderful and great. There's not a thing wrong with it, but it's not the real star of the set. That honor goes to the new 21-inch passenger cars. In a word, they are outstanding. Lionel has done an amazing job with them, and it really deserves recognition. These passenger cars are yet another example of the stuff that Lionel has been doing over the last two or three years that to me says that they are really trying to raise the bar, raise the ante, and make higher quality, more prototypical models. And they've especially been doing it with rolling stock. They've come out with a lot of new freight cars and now passenger cars that are much better and much more prototypical than anything they've ever made. I think these new passenger cars are really some of the best passenger cars that Lionel has ever made, period. Certainly the best O-scale passenger cars they've ever made. They're that good. Now, as always, some people have criticized these new cars. They've said that they're not exactly prototypical when compared to the real thing, and that's true. And there have been some other criticisms as well, like the lack of passengers in the cars that we discussed earlier. But that's par for the course. I don't think Lionel or any other manufacturer has ever put out a product that is criticism free. My opinion of those criticisms is that I really don't care. And the reason I don't care is because these cars overall represent a quality product. They are well built, cleverly designed, and a whole lot of fun. And when you've got that combination and you know that you've got a quality model that is going to run well for a long time, at that point I'm willing to let a lot slide in terms of little prototypical details and road name specific details and stuff like that. As you may or may not know, these new plastic bodied cars were brought out to replace the extruded aluminum passenger cars that Lionel was making a few years ago. Now those extruded aluminum cars were very nice, but they could also be very inconsistent. The paint job, the windows, the trucks could all be problematic at times. And on top of that, from what I understand, the manufacturing process to get those cars made over in China was very inefficient and very cost prohibitive. And so it just made sense for Lionel to go to a plastic bodied car. Now, in most cases, I would never consider moving from extruded aluminum to plastic to be an upgrade, but in this case it was. These cars are in every way superior to the extruded aluminum cars. So long story short, Lionel has really taken a big leap forward with these new passenger cars and that needs to be commended. So by a long shot, the best feature of this set is those new 21 inch passenger cars. 
All right, now comes the fun part. Let's go ahead and start this thing up. This is the dispatcher. Do you copy? Copy that. I read you. Over. Very good. Start up and hold. Okay. Ready to move. Out. Okay, first up, let's check out the whistle. And again, this engine does have the whistle steam smoke effect. So as I blow the whistle, you'll see smoke shooting out of the whistle back here. Up next, let's check out the bell. Here is the steam blowdown sound effect. And here's the sound of water being added to the tender. By pressing and holding the reset button on the legacy remote, we get the sound of coal being added to the tender. Now that I've got the engine powered up, there's something that I want to show you that I forgot to show you earlier, and that is these ground lights on the underside of the engine. There are three per side. There's one here, there's one here, and then there's one way over here. And then there are three on the other side as well. Those ground lights light up if the engine is either stopped or traveling at a speed of under 25 on the legacy remote anything above that speed and they automatically shut off. Lastly, let's check out the crew talk sound effects. Again, I know a lot of people don't like them, but I really don't care because they're a lot of fun. Kids love to hear sounds come out of the engine. And so it's always fun to do the crew talk dialogue whenever I have an open house. Anyway, let's go ahead and check them out. Dispatcher here, please stand by, over. Roger, standing by, out. Dispatch right here, take the green, over. Clear to move, thank you sir, out. Dispatcher, I'm in the clear, waiting instructions, over. Roger that, you're on your mark, out. Dispatcher, the main line all clear, over. Yep, you have a clear track, over. Okay, let's go ahead and roll it out.
right, that about wraps it up for this review. As you've seen, this is an absolutely breathtaking set from start to finish. We've got the gorgeous J3A Hudson on the point, and then those beautiful new 21-inch passenger cars, which as far as I'm concerned are a total home run for Lionel. They're awesome. Now, if you're interested in purchasing one of these sets, the set itself, which consists of the engine and four passenger cars, retails for just under $2,000, right at $1,950. The two-car add-on pack, which I have, retails for $300. And then there's also a Station Sounds car, which I don't have yet, and that too retails for $300. Now keep in mind that those are retail prices. If you go through a good Lionel dealer, you can probably get a decent discount off those retail prices. And as always, if you're looking for a good Lionel dealer, try my favorite train store, which is Legacy Station. You can find them on the web at www.legacystation.com or give them a call at 770-339-7780. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm Eric Siegel, and I'll see you next time. To discuss this model or any other O-Gage trains and to meet other O-Gage modelers, check out the O-Gage Railroading Magazine online forum at ogrforum.ogagerr.com. Here's a look at the top of the cab, and as you can see, it looks great. We've got three vents up here, and all three of those vents open up. <laughs> sort of like that. <laughs>